Well, hello there and welcome to what I'm calling comment section. Just because, well, I'm reading your comments. It's simple as that and obviously responding to them as well. By the way, if you want to have your question answered or you have a hard take, be sure to drop that in the comment section down below. And it's time to start answering questions or commenting on your comments. And with the latest Helix video published a few days ago, a week ago, something like that, Boy, you responded. So, yeah, let's jump over there right away. Short answer, no. 2024 will be wild with multi-effect slash IR slash modular plus FR, FR stuff. We are now moving from the telegraph era into cell phone era. What are the things that you think will be so dramatically different from what we have had over the past few years? Quad Cortexes, all the Kempes, Helixes, Head Rushes, whatever else there is. Like, what are the things that will be so drastically different that you're calling it moving from the telegraph era to the cell phone era? Because, yeah, that's a pretty dramatic change that you're describing. Because in my kind of Helix essay, I kind of took a look at what people are wanting from their devices. And it's nothing that drastic. Like, sure, some incremental improvements, updates, maybe a few features here and there, but nothing that major, to be honest. So I kind of disagree on this one. In the last three years, I've transitioned from HX Tom to Fractal FM3, then Fractal FM9, and finally to Helix Floor. Personally, I believe the Fractal sounds are of higher quality, especially the ambient effects. However, the onboard programming simplicity of Helix, excluding the PC interface, which is good for both brands, is much more practical and intuitive, in my opinion. I find that Fractal sound is greatly appreciated when using headphones, but as soon as you're in a rehearsal room or performing live, the qualitative differences between the Fractal and Helix narrows to the point where I prefer using Helix for its onboard simplicity and intuitiveness. I don't deny that I would like to find on a hypothetical Helix Floor 2nd gen the same quality of ambient effects as Fractal. Nevertheless, I'm content with Helix Floor, which remains an excellent choice even in 2024. First of all, thank you for a well-written comment, really appreciate that. And yes, you're kind of affirming something that I mentioned in my Helix video where, first of all, I don't see what the major updates to that Helix will be. Like hardware-wise, maybe there's some room for improvement, new ports, stuff like that, but it's not major. And software-wise, I think there's still probably room for improvement as well. Otherwise, I think we're just living in a golden age of guitar and all kinds of sounds are available as in different form factors from different manufacturers. And all of those seem to have like slightly different strengths that different people prefer. That's one guy's opinion, at least. I've had my HX Tom for a little over three years now, and it just keeps getting better with firmware updates and my understanding of the unit. I get great sounds out of this small powerhouse. There is a newish model by Hoton called Ampero 2 Stage that has got a great design, UI, and is loaded with great features at good price. I think it's worth checking out. Lee and Todd made a very good video about it recently. Yep, I agree. And if you just need a couple of different foot switches, the HX Stomp is ridiculously powerful, all of that stuff. And yes, I've also seen the Ampero 2 demo by Leon, and yeah, it sounded great. The UI looked awesome. I guess my only question with those brands is that how long that unit will be getting updates because as with Helixes and XFXs and Kempes, we've been getting those for a decade. I'm not sure about these companies just yet. They don't have a proven track record, but I could also be completely wrong with this and maybe they will be updating those for years to come. And I feel this is something that more people should pay attention to when choosing which model to get. For sure, I've had my Helix since launch day in 2015. This thing is a tank. With Line 6 continuing to provide updates and improvements, the decision is easy for me. I don't think I've seen more user-friendly unit than the Helix. First of all, that's pretty cool that you've actually had that since 2015. 2015, it's many, many years ago. It's nine years ago and the thing is still working and you're still having fun. That's really cool and again, you guys are reaffirming something that I argued in the video where I think we are entering a new era where modelers are kind of a longer term thing and we're not switching one every couple of years or so because there's a new shinier thing on the market. And as I mentioned in the Helix video, I think it's better for our wallets, but also the environment as well. So yay! 
This is such a great video, I can relate to it so much. I hope you get tons more subscribers. I grew up in a grunge and heavy rock and became a grunge elitist. And so I decided that if power chords were all that were required to write hit songs, music theory was totally unnecessary unless you were playing classical or jazz or something. I also didn't use a capo. I also thought bass was just lame guitar. I also didn't use a metronome. All of those false beliefs get exposed over the years. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate your honesty. I knew I wasn't the only one. And yeah, things like not using a metronome or practicing with a metronome really, really get exposed when you start recording. For example, I got into recording once I moved out of my like childhood home and got my own kind of studio and apartment and stuff like that and started recording there. And it actually took me a little while to realize why my tracks weren't sounding as professional as some other people's tracks. And yeah, it took me a while, suddenly I realized that I'm not playing in tempo, sometimes I wasn't even playing in pitch, things like that. <laughs> but I think the key to me was kind of admitting those and doing something about it. To people who own this space, I have one and feel the treble knob does not do much. Is this normal on this space? On the contrary, the bass knob does make a big difference, makes it very boomy, kind of too much. Is everyone somewhat happy with stock pop and preamp on Ray 4? Well, I happen to have the bass over here, so let's pick it up and give it a try. I've plugged it into my Helix and I'm using a bass preset made by my friend. It goes for like this Ampex sound. So, all the controls in the middle. Treble on full. Treble all the way off. And then the bass knob in the middle. I haven't really thought about the tone controls that much on that bass, except when recording I might have sometimes turned the treble knob knob up a little bit and maybe took out some of the low end. But as I mentioned in my review of that bass, the things that I might change would be electronics because the knobs also feel a little bit flimsy. And I've also seen a video or two on YouTube where people swap the pickups and the electronics and the bass gets even better. So maybe that's something for you to consider as well. Can it pair with Bluetooth headphones? Now this is something that gets asked a lot in all of the wireless amplifiers, this kind of practice amps I've been demoing on the channel. And the answer is no, you cannot use Bluetooth headphones with this. I know it sounds practical to be able to kind of play completely wirelessly, you have like a wireless dongle in your guitar, and then you would have your wireless headphones. And my guess for the reasons why this hasn't happened yet is that there's probably quite a bit of lag. Because first of all, the guitar goes into your digital amplifier, that adds a little bit of lag when processing the sounds digitally, and then that would have to be processed through the amplifier wireless connection to the, your headphones and there's again a little bit of lag. Maybe the lag is significant enough that most players would hate it. That's my uneducated guess at least and maybe the true reasons are something completely else. What do you think? Do you recommend this or Marshall MG10 as my first amp? So the two amp solutions we're talking about here are a practice amp and this kind of tiny new X plug that you plug into your guitar and control everything via Bluetooth. I personally would say the little amplifier just because there's less to choose from and I think that's really good when you're starting out. You can focus more on just learning how to play. Though, on the other hand, the presets on the Mighty Plug Pro sounded good and you get introduced to different kind of sounds and you can learn that way as well. I'm not 100% sure about this, to be honest. I feel that if you're just starting out, the new X might feel a little bit confusing and there's just too much stuff going on. But then on the other hand, it will probably last you a longer time because there's all drum machines and jam tracks and all those kind of things. So in a way it might be better because it also has presets that sound very decent out of the box and you'll have fun right away. But then again, having an actual amp in your room is also a lot of fun. If I'm totally honest, I'm not 100% sure about this. What do you guys think? What camera do you use on your videos? I use two Panasonic Lumix G7s slash G70s, depending if it's the international version or 
US version or EU version, stuff like that. These are still very decent cameras, you can get lots of different lenses for them as well. Both of mine have these kind of small rig cages which allow me to attach them almost anywhere. I have the whole triad orbit system here as well. I'm going to drop some B-roll there as well, so you can see how this works. I'd say the stock lens on this is tolerable and I use it as an overhead cam for example. But on this camera I'm using a Lumix G something something primer lens which just looks way way better. But yeah, these two have served me well for many years. And besides these two cameras, I many times use my phone as well. I have, I think this is an iPhone 13 Pro and it has a wide angle lens that I use quite a lot, which is, it's very decent, but you need to remember to use some sort of third party app because the automatic color grading on this can get really crazy with studio lights like this. You basically need to set it on manual and kind of go with that. Does it have a rod inside already? This question was posted on the Harley Benton DIY kit video number one. And yes, the truss rod was already in place. I think Harley Benton have been smart by doing that work for you because when you are building a guitar, you need to first of all drill the kind of truss rod cavity and then you place the truss rod and then you glue the fretboard on top of that. And I don't feel that's something a lot of people would like to do at home. And I think they took the right approach where you can just assemble the whole guitar with like a screwdriver and a couple of other basic tools. Amazing music, bro. Well, thanks, bro. Writing music is something that I absolutely love. And it's kind of the point of owning all of these things. And it's just getting feedback like this makes me happy. Really appreciate it. Hey, so I don't know if this is a dumb question or not, but did you ever get it off your fingertips? Because super glue is the last option I can think of for my broken callus and I don't want to wait for it to heal. I'm just worried when I put it on, I won't be able to get it off, you know. So this comment was posted on my YouTube short where I applied some super glue on my fingertips because I had been recording a guitar solo for many hours. My calluses were absolutely killing me, but I still wasn't happy with the take. I applied a little bit of super glue on the fingertips and got it done. And to answer your question, it did wear out I was able to peel the super glue layers from my fingers in me hours almost what it feels. Maybe I'm just very sweaty or oily or something like that. But yeah, you'll be able to get it off pretty fast. And that wraps up the first episode of the comment section show. And I plan to do this maybe bi-weekly, but we'll see if I get a bunch of comments, maybe I'll start doing this every week as well. So if you got a question or you want to voice your opinion on something, be sure to do that in the comment section down below. Likes, shares, all things YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. I shall see you next time.